Today we are uh, returning to have a think about the church. And I say we're returning because that's, of course, what we saw last week from God's Word when we thought about the body of Christ and we looked at 1 Corinthians 12. Um, And there we saw, just as a snapshot, uh, here was last week's title, that nobody is a nobody from 1 Corinthians 12. Every believer in Jesus Christ is part of his body. And so last week we asked, well, what is the body? What, What is it? What is it? How would we define it? And we saw from 1 Corinthians that the body is at least these four things. It is united and diverse. So we saw that as Christians are joined together because of Christ and what Christ has done in saving us from sin, he has then drawn us into his family, the church, his body, the church. And he's made, as he has united us in him, he has equally then made each one of us differently with different gifts, different personalities that are supposed to complement one another in his body. We are united and diverse. Then we saw that we are also connected and intended as Christ's body. So God shows us that in drawing us into his body, he has connected us to one another. And just like individual members of our body, physical members of our body can't function fully apart from the body itself. So individual Christians thrive in their faith by being connected to the body. So we are connected and designed to be connected as Christ's body together. And finally, then we recognize the joy that our inclusion and that our role in the body of Christ is purposeful. It is not accidental. We are intended. We have been placed by God himself into his church universally and locally. He has called us, as we'll see today. And so we can see a confidence from the fact that he has a part for us to play here. We're going to read exactly those words today. And so he has a part for each of us to play, which enables the whole body to flourish for his glory. So what is the body of Christ? It is united and diverse. It is connected and intended. And the passage that we're going to look at today echoes a lot of those same points. So keep an eye out for those as we read our way through. But Ephesians 4, which is where we're going to spend our time this morning, it also helps us to understand some of the purposes of the body. And so what we're going to examine this morning is moving on from what is the body, then to think of, well, what does the body do then? If we know that the body is united and diverse, connected and intended, then what is that body to do? And so we're going to read Ephesians 4, uh, the first 16 verses together. We're going to focus primarily our, our thoughts around verses 11 to 16, but let's read the first 16 verses of Ephesians chapter 4. If you have a copy of God's Word, please do take that, or please do uh, look that up if you Uh, need a copy of God's Word, take one of the Pew Bibles with you. We'd love you to have that. And um, can someone shout out the page number there from the Pew Bible of Ephesians 4? 1175. Thank you, sir. 1175 if you're following along in the Pew Bible. So let's read the first uh, 16 verses of Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient Bearing with one another in love, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And our Father, we pray that you would bless your word to us as we meditate on it this morning. Amen. Now, as we've just read those 16 verses, 
We say this regularly here. I feel like I say it every week, but there are so mu- there's so much, isn't there, that God would teach us through his word. There's so much that we could look at the church, at us as individuals, as us gathered corporately. But one of the things that we surely see, and what I believe God would have us look at this morning, is that the body of Christ, his body, the purpose of it is to be equipped to grow. To be equipped to grow. And particularly when we focus on verses 11 to 16, that language of the body being equipped in order that it may grow, that it may be built up, that it may grow in maturity, that it, that it may... Um, that it may attain to something. There's that aspect of growth because it has been equipped. But but what do these things mean for us? I mean, how are we equipped? And then what does it mean to grow? How, how can we see that growth? How do we recognize that we are growing? Well, these are some of the questions that we're going to try to wrestle with a little bit this morning from God's word. So what does the body, what does the church do? It is to be equipped to grow. And before we get into that, though, I think there's something that we, that we need to and would be helpful for us to make really clear, that all of this equipping, all of this growth is all a result of Jesus Christ. Uh, when we hear language of equipped to grow, some of, us, some of us may well notice our minds racing towards all of the things that we should therefore do, all the programs that we could run, all the initiatives that we could launch, all the metrics that we could use to measure that growth, measure, if you like, our success in that growth. But but I think we need to slow down a bit before we get there. Because when it comes to the body of Christ, the church, our role as its members of the body is to be obedient to our head, to Christ, to where he is leading, to what he would have us do. Not on all of the wonderful programs, as amazing as they may be, he may lead us into them all, fabulous. But if he is not leading us, let's not run ahead of him. He is our head, and the body can do nothing without the will of the head. And so we're reminded of Christ's work in and for the church in these verses. Let me me just briefly mention two things, and then we'll think about why this is so important for us before we get into our equipping and growing. So firstly, the first thing that we need to realize before we get into this is that Christ calls the church. Right in verse 1, Paul writing to this church, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And we see it again at the end of verse 4, the hope when you were called. And so the, the Ephesian Christians are to live their lives reflecting the calling they've received. And we might then ask, well, what is that calling and who made it? Well, the quick and easy answer, although it is no less a glorious answer, is that the call that, that they are to respond to is the call of Jesus to be saved. And so much of the letter of Ephesians up to that point has been about this wonderful calling that these Christians have known that Christ has called them from spiritual darkness and death to spiritual light and life. I mean, you guys are probably sick of me banging on about Ephesians too, but let's never tire of that wonder that we were dead in our sins, but God makes us alive. We deserve wrath. We are children of wrath, but God shows us mercy because of Christ's sacrificial death in our place. And then we read those wonderful verses from verses 8 to 10 of chapter 2. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one may boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we are saved by grace, called by the, the crucified and risen Savior from spiritual darkness to light, from spiritual death to life called from an eternity of punishment for our sin to an eternity of delight in him forgiven from our sin. And so Christ, it is Christ who calls the church, each one of us. None of us earn that privilege. Each and every one of us who is saved by him, we are saved by him and him alone. By his sacrifice, not by anything that we can do to warrant that. And so each member of the body of Christ is only a member of the body of Christ because of Christ. He has called us. And so before we think about how we can be equipped to grow, let's recognize who has called us and how we can even have the privilege of being part of Christ's church. So Christ calls the church. The second thing that we notice from these verses, and we see it, we saw it last week, we see it repeated here in verse 11, is that Christ gifts the church. So we see it in verse 11. So Christ himself gave the the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers. But notice at the start, so Christ himself gave those things to the church. 
Christ, Christ gives gifts to the church. We see it in verse 7 as well, that Christ apportions grace to achieve his purposes. And, and so as we consider the church, and there is a diversity of roles to be fulfilled, yes, in obedience to him. And Christ gives to each individual in a way that means that the whole body is served. The whole body grows. We'll think about that in a minute. And so as we consider the gifting that we see evidenced in the church and how we pray that that would grow, how we pray that we would know our gifting and be released to, to walk in it in obedience to him. But as we think about that and as we, as we witness the equipping of others, let's remember that because Christ gives gifts to the church of those, giving, of those gifts, then there's no room in the church for pride. There's no room in the church for arrogance to think that our gifts are greater, that we deserve greater gifts. No, Christ has given. Equally, there's, there's no room for a, a sort of stunted humility, if I can put it like that, to say, oh, goodness, I, I think I'm maybe gifted in that, but I, I, I can't do that. That, 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 would, that would be putting myself forward. No, Christ gives gifts to the church for the building up of the body. And so if we're walking in obedience with him, then let him lead us. There's no room for pride. There's no room for that false sense of humility. And equally, there's no room in the church for, what should we call it, like Christian jealousy, where we look at other people and wish we had those kind of gifts. No, Christ has given gifts to the church and he has apportioned each to us to achieve his purpose. Remember last week when we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, but in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And so, yes, we are to eagerly desire these gifts. Yes, we're not to be, not to be lazy in our, in our searching after more of the Spirit in our, in, at work in our lives. But we're not to look around and think, goodness, I've got better gifts than A, B, and C. I've got worse gifts than A, B, and C. And what am I doing here? No, God has put each member of his church exactly where he wanted them to be. And so we must learn to be submissive to his wiser wisdom, to, to trust that he equips for what he calls us to in exactly the right way. And therefore we live a life worthy of him. That, that, may, that might seem like a tangent before we get to equip to grow, but the reason we need to remember that, that, that Christ calls, that Christ gifts, is that it, it forces us to keep right at the center that this is Christ's church. So yes, we are a local expression of his universal church here, yes, but verse 15 shows us he is the head of the body of Christ. He is the one who calls. He is the one who gifts. He is the one who therefore equips. He is the one who brings growth. And so the main thing that I would love us to take away from our time this morning is a deeper and more lasting trust in him, the giver of gifts, the one who has called us to himself. May we grow to trust him. May we grow to depend on his leading, on his guiding as we seek to put into practice the very tangible, practical things we're going to see as we think about what the church is to do. So Christ calls. Christ gifts the church. It is Christ's church. He equips. He grows. And so we must learn to follow him. We must learn to lean in, into him, trust in his leading as our glorious head. So with all that being clarified, let's get on to thinking about the purpose of the church. What does the body do? As we said earlier, the body is meant to be equipped to grow. Uh, and one of the ways I think we see this, particularly from verses 11 to 16, is in what some might call these purpose clauses. Now, now that might sound a little bit technical. For those of you who love English and grammar, you're getting excited. For those of you who don't, you're not. Uh, but the, the, what I mean by is a very simple thing, just to look at the text itself and allow the text to help us understand what is being said. And when we do that, we see at least these three phrases. We see two, we see so that, and we see then. And we know from these phrases, these phrases only make linguistic sense if, if that, that something is to be done to enable something. Something has been done so that something else can happen. After something has been done, then something else can take place. And so we see these at the start of verse 12, we see two. The middle of verse 12, we see so that. The beginning of verse 14, we see then. If you're reading in ESV, you'll see a similar language but different words. So you see two at the start of verse 12, four in the middle of verse 12 in place of so that, and so that at the beginning of verse 14. But let's not overcomplicate things. Two, so that, then. 
And let's have a look at what these clauses help us and how they help us to understand what the body does. So the first thing, verse 11 and 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So the purpose for Christ giving these gifts to the church is to enable his people to be equipped for works of service. And we need to recognize that because I think so, some of those rules that are listed there, those gifts that are listed there, are, are generally considered to be linked with those with some kind of leadership responsibility within the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. These are generally roles that, that we assume of some kind of spiritual authority within the local expression of the church. Uh, now, not all of them are exclusively for leadership positions, that's, but that's not what this is really about. There's an impulse here that for those in those leadership positions, those apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, that they are placed there by God for a purpose, and that purpose is to equip the saints, as the ESV states. And so everything that those folks do, they pray, how they teach, what, how they care for us, they do it all in order that we as his people may be equipped that's why Christ gave these gifts to equip his people. But what do we mean by being equipped? How are these people to equip? Well, I think one of the things that we can take from this is that surely it means that, that those in those, those positions, those gifts that Christ has given to the church, that they look out for, for making sure that the, the right tools are in the right hands so that the work gets done. And that means that for, for those in roles of leadership, they must be aware of, of the needs around them. They must be aware of the ministry opportunities that God may be leading them into. They must therefore be aware of the people in the congregation who might be able to meet those needs and help serve. And so speaking personally and on behalf of the office bearers, we want to do this well. We, we want to know the needs. We want to respond to the needs that God is leading us into. And therefore, we can equip this local body of believers for works of service, which God leads us to. And so please, sometimes that begins with a, with a burden that you may have. If God is burdening you with a, a ministry opportunity, or you feel that there would be something that would benefit you as you seek to serve Christ here, then let us know. I'm not saying that everything needs to bottleneck with the office bearers before you serve him. But in terms of equipping one another, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to serve you in any way that we can. And perhaps that means a, a prayerful conversation to help discern what God's wisdom might be on something. And that wisdom might be, that's a good service opportunity. Maybe not here, maybe not now, maybe later. Or yes, let's go for it. Perhaps another way in which we can serve is to, to regularly meet to study the Bible and pray together. Just to grow in our spiritual walks. Perhaps it's a financial investment that, that we as a local church can make in your spiritual development to enable you, to equip you for works of service. Maybe that's how God would use us in that way. These are just some of the ways and some of the examples of what it might look like for God's people to be equipped in this place. But it involves sharing it together encouraging one another, looking for ways in which we can spur one another on, that we can equip, uh, that God's people can be equipped as Christ's body here. So that's the first thing that we learn about this equipping, that Christ gives gifts to equip his people. But those individuals who might be equipped, it doesn't stay with them. There's a corporate aspect to that, and this is what we see in the so that so in verse 12, we see that Christ has given these things to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. You see, individuals are equipped, yes, but, but not simply to then go off and exist on their own. That, of course, they will live for Christ and serve him wherever they find themselves. But that individual equipping leads to a, a service that has benefits for the whole body. So as each of us serve individually, the body is built up. And we knew this from last week too when we thought about that connection that we have, didn't we? That that connection is deep and meaningful. From 1 Corinthians 12, 25, 26, we read, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices. There is a deep connection together. And part of that connection means individual growth, individual serving, individual equipping for that service 
impacts the health of the body as a whole, as, of us as a gathered body here. Each part of the body is equipped so that the body is built up. So the individual and the corporate are linked. And so Christ gives gifts to the church to equip his people for works of service so that the body is built up. And the result of that then we see in verse 14, then then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And so the outworking of this equipping and this beginning, the beginning signs that we're seeing of growth is that there's an understanding of gospel truth and there is a wariness against false teaching. Now, if you read First and Second Timothy, false teaching is something that's rife in and around the Ephesian church. We'll maybe get into that at some other time. But the, the, the defense against false teaching is a growing awareness of the truth. And that equipping and God's people together, then, then means we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth. We're going to say more about that depth of spiritual growth in just a second. But there's a link here between individuals being equipped to serve, which builds the corporate body, and that grows all of us as a unit into growth and maturity. We are equipped to grow. But maybe we need to, to have a little bit of a think, and this is how we'll sort of come to a conclusion, to think about what it means to grow. And how do we grow in Christ as Christ's body? Well, for a start, let's just recognize the number of times that we see this in this passage from verse 11 through to verse 16. Just look at the number of occasions where we, we see something that speaks to us of movement or development or of growth of maturity. So beginning in verse 12, we equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And verse 13, until we all reach unity. See that development there? We begin with this unity, but we are to reach unity in the, faith, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. And in verse 14, we will no longer be infants. Verse 15, we will grow and become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. And verse 16, then, that each and every part of the body, the ligament, every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And so there's this, this very clear impression that the body of Christ is not stagnant. The body of Christ grows. It matures. It is active. It should be, should be pressing on. It should be moving forward. Now, I'll, I'll urge caution around that language of moving. I, I don't say moving forward and progressing like a, like a business consultant might say that about to a, you know, a, a room full of CEOs. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that that image here from Ephesians 4 is a growth, yes, but it's a growth in depth. It's a growth in maturity. And we're told in, in verse 15, we will grow. And how? what's the impact of that growth? What is the outworking of that growth? Look at verse 15 with me. We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is our growth. We grow more like Christ. And so we as individuals and as the corporate body together, we are to grow into Christ, into his likeness, shaped by his character. And so that phrase that we often use, that we grow in Christ-likeness, that's not just a clever soundbite. That is actually what this passage is talking about. As what we are to do as his body, we are to grow into him. We're to grow, mature, be built up, become more like Jesus. Perhaps it's helpful to, to think about two questions here as we come to a finish. Firstly, how do we grow? And secondly then, well, what does it mean to become more like Jesus? So if we are to grow, how are we to grow? How does that take place? Well, from these verses specifically, we can see that we grow, we, that we grow by being equipped for acts of service, which we then ultimately do. So we grow by our service. We grow by living in obedience to what God would have us do, by living and serving in the way that he directs. And, and then, therefore, the body is built up. Did you see that in verse 12, that each one is equipped for works of service so that the body may be built? So there's, there's a link between the service and our growth. So that's one way which, which we grow, we serve. But, but perhaps more personally, we grow by growing in our love for Jesus. 
That's what this growth is. This growth is not going to be measured by, by calendar engagements or positions that you fill on a rota as you seek to serve. Those things are good. We commend them. We're going to ask you to sign up for them next week. But those things are only valuable if they are an outpouring of a heart of love for Jesus. See, we know this all too clearly from the Ephesian church. This letter that we're reading is not the only New Testament letter written to this group of gathered Christians. As I mentioned, we've got First and Second Timothy, which are personal, is a personal letter written to Timothy as Timothy sought to lead the Ephesian church. But we also have a letter to this body of believers recorded for us in Revelation chapter 2. And this letter that we'll read in a second is the first of seven letters that comes directly from the mouth of Jesus to seven churches of Asia Minor. And John is instructed to write them down as part of his prophetic vision and listen to what Jesus has to say to this church And may it serve as a warning to us, but also as a challenge as we see the need to grow in our love for Jesus, not just our activity for him. And so if Revelation 2, I'll begin reading at verse 2. I know your deeds. These are the words of Jesus to the Ephesian church. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Well done, Ephesian church. That is good. That is a wonderful commendation from our Lord and Savior. But verse 4, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. See, this, this church is commended for its activity. It's commended for its action. But it, has lo- it had lost its heart along the way. It had lost its love for Jesus along the way. And that love for Jesus had been replaced by doing good things for Jesus. And that's the trap that we can easily fall into if we, do- if we don't keep our hearts in check. That we can be too busy doing things for Jesus that we neglect our relationship with him. But there's hope in this letter to the Ephesian church from Revelation, just as Jesus called the Ephesian church to repent and do the things you did at first. And that call still stands for those of us who feel like we are doing lots. And to be honest, we are just about to burn out. And along the way, somehow our hearts have grown cold. Well, Jesus would say to us, as he did to this Ephesian church, repent, turn back, turn to the one whom had your heart, who, the one who had your heart at first. Turn back to the one that you're seeking to serve and bring your heart to to him. Deepen your love for him. Grow in your affection for him because of all that he he is and all that he has done. Repent and do the things you did at first. Do those simple, life-giving, relationship-deepening things. Spend time with him. Read his word. Talk with him in prayer. Share him with those who don't know him yet. Invest time and effort in him, not just for him. See, we want to grow spiritually. We want to grow as the body of Christ into our head. Uh, And that means nurturing our relationship with him. Uh, And I don't know what that might look like for you. Maybe that's taking a course at Bible college. Maybe that's uh, learning how to read the Bible more clearly, more consistently. Maybe that's taking a two-day fast from social media to give you some space to pray. Maybe that's converting your summer holiday plans from lying on the beach to a very intentional, spirit-filled, nurturing retreat. It can still happen on the beach. I'm not saying that, but just take your Bible and spend time in it with the Lord. Whatever it looks like and whatever it may cost, if you want to grow spiritually, then we've got to nurture our relationship with Jesus. Let's not forsake the love we had at first. And let's not be so busy doing things for Jesus that we forget to nurture our relationship with him. And I do say that knowing that next week we're we're inviting people to sign up for lots of things. But this week, don't be thinking about, okay, well, where's all the time that I can spend and what, what can I invest? No, spend time with Jesus this week. And then come ready to serve if he so leads you. So how do we grow? Well, we grow by investing 
in our relationship with Jesus by nurturing our walk with him. And secondly then, well, what does it look like to become more like Jesus? Well, I I don't want to sound too simplistic about this, but it it means that our lives begin to look more like Jesus. It means that, that, that our characters become shaped like his, our priorities become shaped like his. And so our thoughts and our words and our attitudes and our actions, they become more closely aligned with how we see Jesus think and act and do in Scripture. And for more details on what that life actually looks like, what a practical Christian life looks like, keep reading through Ephesians. Ephesians 4 and 5 are a practical outworking of what this obedient life lived worthy of the calling looks like. Read the second half of Colossians. Read most of Paul's letters. Read the Gospels. If we want to know what Jesus' life looks like, let's look at it. We have been gifted with it in the Gospels. So spend time watching our Savior And allow the Holy Spirit to shape our minds, to renew our minds, to soften our hearts, and therefore to live out Christ-likeness in our lives. So we are to be equipped to grow. And Christ has given the gifts to equip his people. And we are to grow in maturity in our walks with him. We do that individually and corporately. So the church, the body of Christ... What is it? It is united and diverse. It is connected and intended. What does it do? It is to be equipped to grow. Christ calls us to himself in this wonderful saving offer that we're going to celebrate around the table. And in doing so, he unites us into his body. He he gifts us as his church. He calls us to be his family, as we sung about earlier. And then he gifts his church with with opportunities to serve and to grow in their love for him. Now, is it always easy? No. But his spirit is with us. Do we as individuals make mistakes? Of course we do. Do we hurt one another? Yes, tragically so. But Christ's grace is sufficient for us. See, life in the body of Christ is to be joyful, is to be life-giving as we support and encourage one another while glorifying our head, who is Christ. And the reality is, when we then live like that, with this life of obedience and surrender, then the outpouring of that is love and service to a world around us who needs his good news. And we pray that as we seek to wrestle with what it means to live as the church here, the body of Christ here, in this local expression of it, May we know the grace of God that we see in Acts 2, 47, that the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. See, when when the body of Christ knows who it is and what it is to do, then it will be a compelling witness for the love of Jesus Christ. And may it be so. May we take our responsibilities as members of Christ's body seriously. May we devote the time that we need. May we give our hearts to Jesus again if our hearts have gone cold. And may we then see the Lord adding to our number daily those who are being saved. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you. And we praise you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Father, that you have indeed called those of us who know you and love you. You have called us into your church. And we do indeed want to live a life worthy of that calling. So would you help us, we pray. Help us, Father, to know what what you have equipped us with and where you are calling us to serve. Help us, Father, to know your your wisdom and your discernment, your humility as we seek to, to find that avenue of service that you have put in front of us and you are equipping us for. Lord, I pray for... Um, the the leaders that you have put among us here for our office bearers, Lord, would you give us wisdom and clarity? Would you help us to know how to best serve you? Help us to know, Father, your your leading and guiding in every decision that's made. And Father, may, may those who you have put into those positions, may they indeed equip us as your people for the works of service that you've called us to. And Father, we recognize that growth, spiritual growth, is a supernatural work. And so, yes, Father, we we long to to give you ourselves, to to discipline, to be disciplined in how we live our lives, how we spend our time, how we prioritize you. But, Father, we recognize that you are the one who works. It is your grace that saves us. It is your grace that sustains us. 
It is your grace that brings about that growth and maturing, and so would you help us. Thank you, Father, for your body, the church. Thank you for your church universally. Thank you for your church as it's expressed here through this group of people. Lord, we pray for one another. Would you help us? Equip us for the works of service that you've called us to. Help us to be bold and courageous. Help us to be full of faith when we think of how we should spend our time, our money, our energy in in service of you and of your kingdom. And we pray, Father, in all of those things that you would prevent us from being so insular that we forget the mission that you've called us to, that living this faithful life of obedience and service of you is a way in which you bring your good news to the world. And so would you give us boldness, clarity, faithfulness, assurance, passion, zeal, faithfulness. Help us, Jesus, we pray. And we do indeed ask all of things, all of these things for your glory, for the glory of our head, Jesus Christ. And it is in your wonderful name we pray. Amen.